Good morning and welcome to another edition of United Way for Southeastern Michigan's What's the Word Wednesday. My name is Audrey Walker and today we are going to be discussing a very important topic, how to apply for FEMA assistance if you've been impacted by recent flooding that damaged thousands of homes in our community. The last 10 minutes of today's conversation are reserved for questions, so please leave your questions in the Q&A box if you're watching on Zoom or the comment box on Facebook. Now I'd like to introduce Eric Davis, Vice President of Basic Needs, Health and Outreach at United Way for Southeastern Michigan. Hi, Eric. Good morning, Audrey, and good morning to all of you joining us today. Uh, my name is Eric Davis, and as Audrey mentioned, I oversee the United Way's work helping families in Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties access basic needs supports like food, housing, and health care. As we all know, in late June, devastating floods hit our region damaging tens of thousands of homes and vehicles and leaving thousands of families without access to safe housing. The United Way for Southeastern Michigan, the United Way of Washtenaw County, and our statewide partners at Michigan 211, who are joining us on this call today, have worked tirelessly to connect these families with help to get their homes clean and safe, to disperse funds to community organizations providing assistance, and to help mobilize cleanup volunteers. Last month, President Biden issued a federal disaster declaration for Wayne and Washtenaw counties, allowing residents of both counties to apply for financial assistance through FEMA. Today, we are honored to have Susan Jensen, Individual Assist Assistance Branch Chief for FEMA Region 5, with us to share information about how to apply for assistance from FEMA and to answer questions about the process. We're also joined by multiple other subject matter experts from FEMA who can answer questions about flood mitigation, small business assistance, and other questions related to the flooding disaster. Susan, thank you for joining us today. And thank you and your team at FEMA for helping Michigan families through this difficult situation. Thank you so much. It's a delight to be here working with the United Way, which is a very valuable partner of FEMA's and all of our voluntary agency partners. Um, so this is a real opportunity. And I am also looking forward to getting out the information about how people who have been impacted by the floods can apply for assistance. Um, first slide, please. Thank you. There are several ways to apply for FEMA assistance. The most important thing is that you use one of these if you have been impacted by the flooding. The first way or the perhaps one of the easiest ways is to actually call and talk to someone on our teleregistration um, hotline. The number is 800-621-FEMA or 621-3362. People can also apply if you have the technology on disasterassistance.gov. Um, we have an app that you can download. And in addition, there are disaster recovery centers, depending on where you live and what is the easiest for you to access. This is, this is a way to actually go in, see someone in person and provide your information there. And I, I didn't put the addresses of the DRCs on a slide, but I certainly have that information. It's important to know that if you live near a DRC or you happen to be in the area of another DRC, you can go anywhere you want. Um, your information is computerized and we can pull, up, pull that up from any location. We also have teams of people who are either working out of a, a facility or who are going through neighborhoods. They're called disaster survivor assistance teams. They are also able to register people. So if you have the opportunity, you see someone in a blue FEMA shirt with a tablet, you can talk to them as well. Next slide. So what's the process after you've actually registered for assistance? You may hear from an, a FEMA inspector to schedule an appointment this is the first step in many cases for people to receive disaster assistance. However, and this is a very important caveat, there are people who, when they registered, indicated that they had minimal damage and that they were able to live in their homes. You may, if that's your situation, receive a letter that says you're ineligible. 
However, that can easily be overturned. You can call the registration number and say, you know what, my information has changed. I have more damage than I expected, or I have a situation now because of the damage where I can no longer live in my home. That will trigger an inspection. Um, we've had a lot of questions about denials or people who have been determined to be ineligible. That does not mean that that is FEMA's final decision. That means there are instructions in the letter that you need to follow. Either documentation needs to be um, added or verified, or that's something very simple like calling in and saying, I, my situation has changed, can, can again trigger the overturning of that. Um, generally speaking, for this particular disaster, people are getting ineligible letters because they've indicated that they have insurance. They haven't been able to prove occupancy or ownership or because of reporting minimal damage. A lot of the owner and occupancy issues are being resolved at the inspection. This is a very critical thing that FEMA has done recently. This is the first disaster, in fact, where we are letting inspectors in the field look at that documentation and then make the person eligible at that point, or at least able to move through the process. Um, so that is a critical piece, but please, if you get an ineligible letter or a denial letter, do not be disheartened. If you have questions about how to address that, go to one of the DRCs or call the 800 number. That's a critical step that you can take in moving through the FEMA application process. So if, if that is not your circumstance and you get a call from the inspector, they will ask some um, basic questions about the damage you received to your home. They will also on the phone ask for verification. They have your social security number and they have your FEMA registration number. If they say, can I have your social security number? They may not be calling from FEMA. What they will do is say, I'd like the first four digits of your registration number or the last four digits. When you provide one or the other, they will respond with the you know, alternate. If they give the first four, you will get the last four, if that makes sense. This is how our inspectors know that they are talking to the correct person and you as an applicant know that you are talking to a FEMA inspector. Next slide, please. When the inspector actually arrives at your home, there are a few things that you need to remember. Um, you or your co-applicant must be present in order to conduct the inspection. Um, so if you have registered and your spouse is your co-registrant, one or the other of you needs to be there. What will the inspector ask for when they actually arrive at your home? They'll ask for your FEMA registration number. And again, first four, last four. They'll look at a photo ID. They need to see like a, a government issued photo ID. Then proof of occupancy. That is true for owners and renters. And if it's a homeowner, they will ask for proof of ownership. Next slide. So during the inspection, there are a few things the inspectors will do. They will stay outside your home. We are still following COVID precautions, particularly now with the Delta variant. This is a measure that we've taken in order to make sure that you and your family and our inspectors are protected. They will ask about your disaster damage. They will um, ask you a lot of questions. If you have pictures, they will look at those, but they will also ask that you go to the area of damage with your smartphone, with your tablet, and video stream the damage. They will ask particular questions while you're doing this as we look for verification of items that FEMA can cover. Um, it's important to remember that FEMA is not insurance, it will not make your home whole. It is a way for people to resume living in their home 
we look at safe, secure, and habitable. We want to make sure that the things that are necessary to, to live in a home um, are functioning. We want to make sure that you have a working furnace, that you have a working water heater, that your sewer isn't backing up. We want to make sure that there's electricity and a, a stable structure. Those are the types of things that FEMA addresses. There are also some personal property items that we look at in essential living spaces. Um, the inspector can explain some of that to you, but what the inspector cannot do is determine eligibility. Um, I wouldn't even ask them because they don't know. They are simply collecting data. They are looking to record the damage that they're seeing, that you're telling them about, and that eligibility determination is made by FEMA itself. Our inspectors right now are contract inspectors. They will not be wearing FEMA shirts, but they will have a FEMA issued ID. It looks just like a government ID and it will have a green stripe across it. So you can see that they're inspectors from FEMA. They also will not ask for payment. This is not something that requires money on your part. This is part of the FEMA registration process. So they will not ask for payment. They will not ask for credit card information. They will not ask for social security information. Again, they will have your social security number. It's part of your FEMA registration. So if someone comes to your home and asks for those things, please be wary, please be careful. If you wanna know if an inspector was scheduled to come to your home and maybe someone showed up, you can call the 800 number and get verification of that. It's also important to note that our inspections, FEMA inspections, do not replace insurance inspections nor the SBA inspection process if you have applied for an SBA loan. Our inspection process is, is very separate from those things. And again, is looking to address items that are within FEMA's programs. Insurance um, is something that's different and your policy may cover things that FEMA does not. In addition, um, an SBA inspection is looking for things that are different than what FEMA offers because SBA, um, and this is a low interest loan, can, can return you to your pre-disaster condition. FEMA's assistance does not, nor is intended to do that. Next slide. After you've had the inspection, you will be sent a decision letter and that will let you know if you're eligible and what assistance you are eligible for. Um, our letters are a fairly nonspecific in how you need to use that money um, if you receive money, but it will say this is for repairs or this is for personal property. Um, it, it will at least give you that much information. If you are eligible, you will receive either a treasury check or direct deposit. You make those decisions when you register with FEMA, whether you do it on the 800 line, whether you do it disasterassistance.gov. It's up to people to make that decision themselves. Not everyone has a bank account, a checking or savings account, and which then would make direct deposit a really good choice for them. Um, direct deposit is obviously the fastest way to get money into your bank account. Um, a treasury check can take an additional seven to 10 days to be sent, um, but then you will have, you will have that check. Um, that concludes my formal presentation, but again, um, there are lots of other people on the phone. If you have SBA questions or questions that you want to address specifically about your FEMA registration or our process, thank you. Thank you, Susan, for all of that wonderful information. And we do have a lot of questions um, coming through um, about some of the things that you mentioned. But I did want to ask first, is, is there anything I should be doing first before applying for FEMA assistance? Well, what I would recommend, and, and this is true for everyone, um, is to clean up your home. It, it, is not important for FEMA to have the damaged 
um, property in your basement. Um, we have other ways of verifying what you're telling us, including that video verification that I talked about. Inspectors look for clues. It is unhealthy and unsafe to live in a home that is not cleaned up. So whether you intend to apply for FEMA or not, um, please do not wait to clean up the flood damage. That's a critical piece. As far as what to have with you when you're applying, you need to, of course, have you and any co-registrants social security information. We need to have the address of the damaged dwelling, where you might be living now if you've had to relocate, telephone numbers. That's the critical information that we ask for. Okay. And then I know you mentioned uh, taking a video using a uh -huh. smartphone or a tablet. Is there assistance if you don't have access to a smartphone or a tablet? Right. Our inspectors um, have made allowances for that and they have other ways. I mean, they may look in the windows, um, they may ask additional questions, they may look at video that somebody has taken of the damage to be able to verify that that's what actually occurred in your particular home. A lot of people have pictures, a lot of people have video. That is not the only way that we will confirm. There will be other ways that the inspectors will use if someone doesn't have the technology to do that video streaming. Okay. And then is there any sort of code or number, or anything that needs to identify the damage for the particular time frame of June 25th and 26th flooding? Um, I'm not sure that I 100% understand your question, but when people register, we ask, what was the date of damage? Okay. Um, we are finding that, that, you know, people have damage from some of the um, additional storms mm -hmm. that occurred as well. Um, but, but that is the, the date, the eligibility or the incident period that we're looking at right now. Okay. So if there was flooding in their home on a different date, would they be eligible for this assistance or is that something different? No, they would not be eligible okay. for this assistance. So, so specifically any of the, for that June. Yes, it's particularly for those two June dates. And um, we had some other questions about the, um, if you did get a denial letter, and I know mm -hmm. you expanded on that a little bit as far as it's not the final decision, but right. if, if I got a denial letter, would, would we still expect an appointment from an inspector or would I need to file for any sort of appeal or anything like that to hear, hear from an inspector? Right. You will not automatically get an inspection if you were determined initially to be ineligible. That being said, there are some very easy things that can be overturned. For example, if if they got a letter that said ineligible, reported no damage. That is, um, well, we've had a lot of people receive that letter, but they just need to make a call to the 800 number and indicate that they have additional damage that they weren't aware of, or that for some reason they can't live in their home. We also have an auto dialer going out this week to people who have that ineligibility code. Um, if you see a number on your phone that pops up and you did get, receive one of those letters, I recommend answering that. If in fact you do have more damage, you can't live in your home anymore, you can press one and that will trigger an inspection. And it, do I have options if I feel that the inspection was incomplete or incorrect in some way? Yes, yes you do, you can appeal. And again, um, that involves uh, either contacting the helpline, going into one of the disaster recovery centers and talking you know, to someone about what your options are and what you need to include in your appeal to be reconsidered. Um, that certainly is something that does occur. Um, and if there's a letter or if for another ineligibility code, you've received a letter, I really recommend to read that letter. If it's not clear or you have questions, call the 800 number or go into a disaster recovery center. There are people there who can help interpret it, but also who can help um, identify the types of documentation that you need to turn in 
in order to have your appeal addressed. And so if there is damage from the flood, but it's on the outside, not the inside, would that, is there still assistance for that? Would that, would this potentially cover that as well? Yes, um, we, we noticed when we did the preliminary damage assessment prior to the declaration that some people did have foundation damage. That's something that you can see from the outside in many cases, um, and that is absolutely eligible if it's, if it's from the storm um, as determined by the inspection. Um, again, our criteria is that your home is safe, secure, and habitable. A foundation um, is a critical piece of that building structure. And so that is something that we definitely look at um, in terms of future habitability of the home and how that damage impacts the home as a whole, the structural um, integrity of the home. Now, is there a specific process if um, you don't have homeowners if you don't have homeowner's insurance um, or um, if you don't have, you had mentioned there was some issues with getting owner occupancy as well. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the insurance piece. Mm -hmm. um, in the federal sequence of delivery, which is established by statute, we ask people to access their insurance first. Um, and if they say that they have insurance, they need to be able to show FEMA that the insurance did not cover all of their losses or that it wasn't applicable to the cause of damage. The unfortunate thing with flooding is that homeowner's insurance does not cover that. You can get an additional insurance rider, like a sewer backup rider on your home insurance. And we would consider that, but homeowner's insurance on its own does not cover this type of damage. Um, people who indicated that they have insurance will get an ineligible letter because they now have to show us that their insurance either did or did not cover that cause of damage. There's a declaration page in an insurance policy. That's what FEMA needs to see. And that's, an, that's part of the appeal process. Um, if people do not have insurance, and indicated that when they were registering, they will go directly to FEMA. Um, they will not be sent in an eligible letter that says, you said you had insurance, please show us what it covered, what it didn't cover. They will just immediately be referred during the FEMA registration process right to the first grant program. Okay. And then um, how long does it normally take before you hear something back? from FEMA after submitting the application? Um, they should hear something within seven to 10 days. They and so then receive. if they don't, should they call back or how would they check upon their application? If, if they have a disasterassistance.gov account, they can go to that and they can check there or they can call the 800 number and check to see what's happening. People will receive or should receive a letter indicating that we received their registration and saying, you know, you're, you're ineligible right now because of these reasons, or you are eligible, you'll be receiving a call from an inspector. Um, it's possible that the inspector will call them first um, okay. to, to set up an appointment. And so you're gonna receive a letter either way, and when you receive a call from FEMA, would that come from an 800 number? Is it a specific number? Is it outlined in the letter? Or like, how would no, I know? They, they, will, they will receive a call from an inspector. Okay. That will be their first, their first actual contact um, from a human. And that inspector then will set up an appointment with them. Now, all the inspectors have their own phone numbers. So the way to know that you're talking to a FEMA inspector is that they will already have your information. And that's why they do that validation where they say, um, can I have the first four numbers of your registration? And then they will provide the last four. Um, and okay. that's critical. They're not going to be saying, I need your social security number. They already have someone's social security number mm -hmm. because it's part of the FEMA registration. 
So if somebody calls and they are pretending to be an inspector, they won't have that information. So that's, okay. that's the way that, that people who have applied can know that they are actually talking to a FEMA staff person. And then I know, I know we're getting to the end here and we've got a lot of questions coming through, but I do have two more that I know we haven't um, covered. One, is there a cap on the amount you receive uh, from FEMA? And two, is there a deadline to apply for assistance? Excellent questions. Let's do the deadline first. September 13th is the uh, deadline to apply. Um, and I really recommend that people do that as soon as possible if they intend to register with us. As far as a cap, yes, there is a cap, a statutory cap of $36,000. We are finding um, that the type of damage that we have here um, does not does not exceed that amount. Although we have had one, I believe, that actually had a destroyed home, um, which would constitute you know, foundation damage at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, people receive money to um, do cleaning and sanitizing. They may receive money for furnace and water heater repair. There is also now with FEMA, a mitigation component. So if people have a certain level of damage, they will receive money as part of their repair assistance to elevate their furnaces, their water heaters, or even possibly uh, elevate their electrical panel. There's also a component, again, based on the degree of damage that the inspectors can verify that can pay to move a furnace. Um, and again, this is to address the repetitive flooding issues that we have here in this area, Southeast Michigan. Um, this is not the first time that FEMA has had a disaster declaration here. And it is very distressing for homeowners to continually have to deal with this by elevating their mechanicals like the furnace. Um, we can prevent at least that type of loss again these floods are not always covered. There may not always be assistance. And so mm -hmm. we want to get people's essential components of their home out of the way. Well, you know, we really want to thank you for being here, sharing all this information. There were a lot of questions. I want to thank everybody for participating. I'm just going to say the 800 number out loud, because I don't know if we said it. it's 1-800-621-FEMA, which is one 800 621 six, two. So thank you so much for that. And I'm going to turn it back over to Eric. Hey, thanks, Audrey. And thanks again, Susan. Uh, we have a few more important updates to share before we close out today's What's the Word Wednesday Town Hall. Two one one. Uh, as a reminder for anyone in our community who may be experiencing a need, including assistance with the impact of the recent flooding, our 211 helpline remains available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We maintain a running list of available services in the community and can connect you to the supports you need. You can also look up resources in your area by using our 211 resource database at unitedwaysem.org backslash 211. And we'll put all these links in the, in the chat as well for everyone. <clears throat> Uh, we also have uh, upcoming a uh, virtual literacy fair. Parents, students, and educators, uh, you're all invited to join us this Saturday, August 7th for United Way's Summer Virtual Literacy Fair. Hear from experts on everything from boundaries and effective communication to literacy for your teenager. Register for the Summer Literacy Resource Fair at unitedwaysem.org backslash literacy fair. And last but not least, uh, next week at our What's the Word Wednesday Town Hall, we'll be joined by the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission to share why it's so important for all of us to be involved in the redistricting process. To see our previous town halls and to sign up for email updates and upcoming town halls, please visit unitedwaysem.org backslash virtual town halls. The website is also included in the chat box. Thank you so much to everyone. We will see you soon. Please stay safe and continue to live united.